Hi there, my name is Ryan and I'm a guide with uh, MiR Adventures and I just wanted to put together a nice uh, concise equipment list for any of our rock programs. Uh, this one's going to be geared specifically towards Smith Rock and our Smith Rock Climbing course, uh, but it really will apply to um, plenty of other courses we have like our track climbing course and um, our uh, other one day or two day climbing courses. Uh, you can pretty much apply this to any time that we're going to be camping uh, at a crag or even just at a crag for one day. And uh, just a few changes here and there, which you'll see in the emails that we send out to you um, before the courses and even some meetings that we may have before the course. But uh, I just wanted to talk about our Smith Rocks trip so that way you have a good idea of what to bring, what to expect, and, uh, and then we'll go on from there. So essentially, we'll be climbing at Smith Rocks from anywhere from three to five days. These trips happen in May and October. At least that's what we have listed on our website. Uh, if you do want a custom trip sometime in the middle of the summer, we can also work that one out as well. Or even um, different times in May and October if you want to move some stuff around, that's perfectly fine as well. Uh, we, uh, in this climbing course, uh, we call it a course, but it's really kind of up to you. Uh, we'll do uh, whatever the clients want. If you want to just climb for five days, then we'll do that. If you want to learn some skills anywhere from single pitch belaying, uh, lead belaying, multi-pitch climbing, trad climbing, multi-pitch trad climbing, we can pretty much do it all at Smith. And uh, you'll walk away with a healthy understanding of each as well as um, different uh, suggestions from our guides that we have there. Um, Essentially, uh, it can be anywhere from three to five days, and you can see the prices on our website, which I'll have linked in the description below. And so uh, you can seek out more information there, or you can always contact me, Ryan Tilly. Uh, I'm the more or less the guy in charge. And uh, if you have any questions about the specific course, you can ask me about that, or if you want to do anything special in particular, then we can also uh, work something out on that front. So you can email me at rtillsalive.com. I got it down there and um, if we, You can just feel free to ask me any sort of questions uh, So first things first, let's talk about the gear that MIAR will provide for you that you don't need to own in order to attend this trip All right, so here I have everything laid out on the table uh, First thing MIAR will provide for you that will definitely save you some money in the long run are all the camming devices and uh, other bits of shiny gear that we stick into the rock in order to protect ourselves. Even if you're going to Smith Rocks with the intention of learning to trad climb, we will still have all this equipment here for you and uh, you can use our equipment while you learn. Uh, if you do want to buy cams beforehand and uh, and uh, use your own equipment while you're out there, then we're not going to stop you. In fact, you can go into the MIAR store. We have a healthy selection of these things, so that way you can have your own equipment that you want to learn on. But that's by no means a requirement. So we'll have all the cams, all the stoppers, and then maybe some other weird beats of, bits of jewelry um, just to mess around with. But we'll have all that equipment for you. Another thing that we will have are all the quick draws. Uh, we'll bring probably <laughs> close to like 60 quick draws. So you guys definitely don't need your own. Uh, you will you can use all of our equipment. Uh, we uh, all have Alpine draws and sport draws and uh, everything in between. Again, if you have your own equipment, uh, if you want to bring your own climbing gear, no matter what it is, then feel free to bring that. Uh, you can definitely use your own equipment if you want. And then we will we'll have no problem <laughs> with saving our equipment from a little bit more wear as well. But um, by no means is this a requirement to bring you. Cams and quick draws, we have all that for you. Another thing we'll have are anchor materials like uh, quad slings and cord. Uh, we'll have all that equipment. So for top roping days, for multi-pitch climbing or whatever, uh, we'll have all that set up. So that way you don't have to bother bringing any uh, rock anchor material. Uh, I'll also have pretty much everyone's going to have a guidebook with them and uh, you can feel free to look through I think this is going to be the group guidebook So if you even want to borrow this for a night and look at it, then you can feel free to do that uh, I'm sure we'll have a couple of these with us. So there'll be no st shortage of guidebooks Another thing we'll have 
our parking passes. This is just a representation of the parking pass um, because I don't have the Smith Rocks ones yet, but the Discover Pass will not work for Smith Rocks. You need an Oregon State Parks Pass, which uh, MIAR will provide for you um, when you get there, and that way you don't have to pay to park. But we'll have those for you. Another thing we'll have are ropes. We'll use all of MIAR ropes. If, again, if you want to bring your own climbing rope, uh, feel free and we'll have no problem using it as long as it is an actual rated climbing rope, not like the Home Depot ropes that you buy uh, for whatever with like a tensile strength of 200 pounds. You want an actual rope for climbing and I'm sure no one's gonna debate with me on that. But uh, either way, MIAR will have all of our own ropes or the guides will have uh, their own ropes. There'll be plenty of ropes. If you want to bring yours, then by all means, uh, I would encourage that. Another thing we'll have, uh, all the guides will have some form of medical kit with them. And uh, I also carry around some extra supplies, like this is a SAM splint, uh, just in case, you know, some sort of break or whatever. Uh, the guides will all maybe have different medical kits or uh, something like that. So that'll just be to treat, you know, normal bleeds, band-aids, uh, boo-boo ouch sort of stuff. Maybe we'll have some sort of Benadryl. Uh, Tylenol, you know, very easy over-the-counter pain medications, something like that. Uh, maybe some aspirin too. But uh, ultimately, if you have any medications that you have to take, then bring those for yourself, and you have to take those for yourself as prescribed by your doctor. Uh, none of us are doctors, and none of us can actually prescribe any sort of medication. So you're on your own for that much. Here I have a wag bag. And uh, I carry one of these in my pack just because the last time they were free and I, I grabbed one and threw one in there. But Smith Rocks actually has a ton of toilets around it and it's not that big of a place. So uh, chances are you won't be needing uh, this wag bag. I carry that for emergencies, <laughs> so to speak, uh, for anyone who would need it. Uh, but um, it's not exactly something that you need to bring. You may want to throw one in your backpack just in case though. So this is a list of everything that Mirror will provide for you. Uh, throughout the rest of the video, I will explain like uh, what different items that Mirror also provides, like in camping equipment and stuff like that. But um, and we can provide it in terms of renting it to you, or uh, you can buy it from our store. Uh, if you work out something special, you may get some other offer or deal on that. But uh, everything in our store, if you're signed up for MIAR, you get a 20% discount. Um, well, just about everything. <laughs> not, not exactly everything, but you do get a nice discount on equipment, uh, especially if it pertains to the course. And then um, if, again, if anything pops up that you can borrow from us, then I will mention it when I have it in front of me. But all this equipment is stuff that we'll have and uh, by no means will you need to have it in order to attend a course. All right, so now let's talk about the gear that you as the client will need for our uh, MIAR trip. Uh, first thing I have in front of me is the helmet. Uh, we want you to have an actual climbing rated helmet, not a bike helmet, definitely not a ski helmet because those things are super heavy. This is a really lightweight model. We have some harder shell, little less lightweight models uh, in our rental fleet so you can pick up a helmet from us if you don't want to buy one But uh, a climbing helmet is definitely a must and we're gonna wear this every day that we're climbing uh, And then just every time that we're actually at a crag. So very important. Definitely a must-have Throw that on the ground Another must-have is a harness <laughs> And uh, yeah, you can't go climbing without a harness, right? And so this is a actual rated climbing harness. Uh, you can get these from our store, you can rent them from us, or you can just uh, use the one that you use at the gym. Any climbing harness will do. One thing I don't recommend are mountaineering harnesses because they, those just don't have the padding that these climbing harnesses have. And that will become really apparent when you're on any sort of semi-hanging belay or something that's not a ledge, and it's gonna really suck. So. If you have been on some of our mountaineering trips before and you uh, used uh, one of these harnesses or one of those mountaineering harnesses, you're definitely going to want to step up to an actual rock climbing harness. And again, we sell these at our store and we can rent them to you, so uh, that should be no problem on uh, how to get your hands on a climbing harness. Another thing that's nice to have 
Obviously you're gonna want some climbing shoes. These are something that we can get to you from the store, uh, but it'll be, it's kind of hard on the store because there's so many different needs for shoes. Uh, I would recommend just getting your own pair and then that way you would have your own pair of climbing shoes. A lot of you have had rock climbing experience before, so you probably own your own pair of shoes anyway, so definitely bring your own shoes. Uh, these are a really flat model, uh, meant for all day climbing. Um, if you want to bring your aggressive shoes and proj hard stuff, uh, then feel free to do that. I'll, I'll hang out there and proj hard stuff with you too. Uh, but uh, feel free to bring a couple different extra pairs of shoes if you want. Obviously have your chalk bag. I do recommend having a chalk ball and not loose chalk unless you are playing to proj hard stuff. In that case, maybe bring two chalk bags. Uh, because I've had plenty of situations at Smith actually where all my loose chalk is blown out of my chalk bag uh, Due to really high winds and so a chalk ball is really nice in that case to uh, avoid losing all your chalk And it's not like on those long easy routes. You really need have a need for a lot of loose chalk in your chalk bag uh, That's just uh, it's not exactly a, a performance threshold on that part as far as technical climbing gear uh, I would like you guys to have an ATC or a Petzl Reverso, some sort of belay device, tubular belay device. And we'll use this for obviously belaying and a bunch of rappelling. With that, it's nice to have one locking carabiner. In fact, you definitely want one locking carabiner at least to go with your ATC. You just keep those clipped together. Another thing, if you would like to bring, is an auto assist brake device or some sort of extra belay device. I prefer using the Grigri for a lot of things like sport climbing or whatever. And so I'll definitely have uh, a couple different devices with me uh, aside from just the ATC. And I usually keep at least, you know, well, I usually keep a locker with that. It's kind of useless without one. In addition to your one or two or multiple belay devices, it's nice to also have an extra locking carabiner and another extra locking carabiner. Uh, you don't have, uh, I have three hair beaners right here, which are the ones that flare out a lot, but uh, you can also incorporate one of these pair beaners, can be a D locking carabiner. Um, but I would like you to have at least two of these wider pair models. Actually, this specific carabiner right here, and I think this one too, we sell both of these at the store and they are both great carabiners. So I would recommend if you don't have any, then just go out and buy three of these and then you're good to go. And not just for our trip, for like all of life pretty much too. You'll also need either a double length sling. See, you know it's a double length sling because if you fold it twice, it fits over your shoulder. See, nice and comfortably. It's also in some circles called a 48 inch sling or a 60 centimeter sling. And so you're gonna need one of these as your rappel tether. And if you don't know what that is, then you'll definitely learn during the course. But either have one of these, or you can have one of these. This is, uh, I think this one's made by Black Diamond, and it's called the Link or something. Uh, this, the overall term for these things is called a personal anchor system, or a pass for short. And so Metolius has one, uh, just about every company has one of these sort of style setups and then we'll also use this as a rappel tether as well So either your double link sling or your pass three locking carabiners one ATC Extra belay device if you would like and then that's all the required equipment One thing I would recommend actually is also one or two non lockers and that's just something that you can rack your double link sling or your personal anchor system on and so, uh, so that way your locking carabiners are free to be used throughout the day. One item that's not really recommended, or uh, <laughs> sorry, required, but I highly recommend is a pair of belay gloves. And uh, also with the pair of belay gloves, another non-locking carabiner just to hang them on. Uh, but uh, I, these aren't required because it's not like it's life or death that you don't, you have belay gloves but they really help your control while repelling, especially with thinner ropes and, uh, and belaying with thinner ropes, belaying with uh, less forgiving devices like your ATC. And they also just help keep your hands clean, help keep the 
On the really long rappels, your hands do heat up from friction, no matter how fast you go. Belay gloves really help out with that. And they're just, uh, they're actually becoming more and more of a critical safety item than anything else. So I would definitely, I'd say the belay gloves, even though they're not required, they're just about, they're so recommended that they are required. So give some serious thought into bringing belay gloves. We sell these gloves and many others at MIAR. So you can just pick them up there as well as plenty of non-locking carabiners. So you can pick up those there as, pick up the, those there also. Uh, obviously if you, uh, if money's tight, you can borrow pretty much all this equipment from some of our guides. But uh, we're also limited on the amount of equipment we have. And depending on how many people go, we may not have enough to supplement this with everyone. So uh, if that is a problem, then you can talk to folks at MIAR and then work something out. Uh, but also you do get that discount and uh, you will need all this critical gear in the future if you plan on keep on climbing. So I would recommend to actually just buy all of this. All right, let's talk about backpacks. So uh, I have two different types of backpacks, actually three. Here, I'll throw this one up. And they sort of serve different purposes. Uh, this one right here, this is my backpack. Uh, I've, I've used this a lot for rock guiding. It's a 35 liter pack, uh, Black Diamond, what's it called? Creek pack. And so what I do is I just put all the gear that we need uh, and all my personal gear and food and water and stuff. And then I usually shove this smaller pack in there too. And I keep this pack at the base of the climb and then bring this pack as my on-route pack. Now you guys probably won't always need to do that system yourself. What I recommend uh, is maybe a fat pack in the 30 liter range. And the cool part about this one is it is made for climbing. So what I like to do when I do use this is I, I have it packed full when I'm out climbing for the, or when I'm walking to the base of the crag. When I'm about to climb, I take everything I need out of it, put my food, water, maybe my approach shoes in there, take the hood off and shove it in the pack. And then it's actually decently compact and uh, okay to climb with. If you don't want to climb with a backpack this big, maybe you're a smaller person, then you can always bring a smaller backpack and then uh, just take this on routes and then leave this at the base like I do. Or if you can manage to actually work with a smaller backpack, something like 25 liters all day, then you can just roll with that backpack all day. Maybe you'd have to pull some tricks like wearing your harness out of the car or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, you ultimately do. Uh, also, some of the routes actually at Smith Rocks are kind of small uh, that we would want backpacks for. So another option is we can just condense all of the group, all the gear like food and water for everyone and approach shoes perhaps into one backpack and then the guide will carry that. So there's actually a number of different options we can do. I'm gonna have a couple different backpacks with me there just in case. Um, but uh, the, they'll definitely, we'll always have something that we can do uh, to make sure that we have a backpack with us. And uh, we'll go more in depth in that into, uh, into what we bring like during the actual course. But that is something worth thinking about. Maybe bring a small pack or like, and a bigger pack or just one middle size pack. And if you uh, have a certain idea of yourself, anyone at MIAR can help you out. If you walk in there and ask uh, the employees or me, or if I happen to be in there, or any one of our guides, we can help you out with that, with what to do in that case. All right, now let's talk about suggested clothes to bring. And uh, I got a lot of clothes laid out here, but just know that we probably won't be using all of them. Uh, I'm just trying to cover all the seasons from early May to late October, and I'll sort of explain why as we go. Uh, I like to think about the clothing system as from either top to bottom or bottom to top. So I'm gonna start talking about the feet and then end on the head. Um, as for feet, uh, I'm gonna bring two different types of shoes with me. Uh, obviously I got, well I don't know if these really count as shoes, but they are flip flops. And so uh, I just wear these in camp or after uh, the day or maybe even before the day just before I get my feet stuffed into either my approach shoes or my climbing shoes, helps air out a little bit. And uh, by having your feet, uh, you know, free and in the air, it actually does help cool you off a little bit, or at least it makes me feel cooler. So just to 
you know, air out my feet at the end of the day. I got my flip flops. Over here I have my approach shoes. And uh, these are the Scarpa Cruxes. Uh, this is like the third pair I've had of these things. And um, I gotta say they are really great approach shoes. Uh, we do sell a number of approach shoes at the store. Um, so you can check out what we have there. Basically what an approach shoe is, is it's the combination of a normal street shoe and a climbing shoe. So the bottom is made with sticky climbing rubber and uh, you can actually climb a decent amount in these things, or at least I have. And um, they still have the comfort of normal climbing shoes. And what these allow us to do is to take certain options or approaches where uh, we couldn't normally take if you had normal shoes. Uh, if you have trail running shoes, like you like to trail run, then those would be just fine as approach shoes because they're made out of the same sort of rubber. Uh, they wouldn't be as good to climb in, but you're probably going to be using your climbing shoes anyway. If you have street running shoes, then I would definitely not recommend bringing those because uh, I learned that lesson the hard way. Street running shoes do not grip to rock at all. They're very firm. Uh, approach shoes, they aren't exactly mandatory, at least not for now. Maybe they will be in the future. But uh, if you have any questions about your footwear, just ask whoever at Miar or write that on the uh, email list uh, with your questions about what kind of footwear you have and then we can uh, say, you know, oh, it's good or bad or whatever. And, you know, a number of different shoes will actually work. Just my recommendation would be approach shoes. Good pair of hiking socks. You can bring as many pairs as you feel you need, maybe one a day. I have a friend who likes to do that. But uh, these are darn tough socks. Any sort of hiking socks will work. Um, I do recommend the ones that are uh, smaller, like that fit your shoes. If you're gonna bring hiking boots, then bring hiking socks that go up higher. But uh, these ones, they just go up to my ankle because these shoes only go up to my ankle. So have the right size of sock for the right footwear you have. Uh, another thing I like doing is runner's socks. Runner's socks, uh, they hold up a lot to wear. Uh, if you use just standard cotton socks, you're probably gonna get holes in them uh, after like a day or two. So they, they aren't made for a lot of wear. So bring either runner's socks or darn tough socks or whatever sort of socks that can hold up to a lot of abuse. Moving up now to the lower body, uh, I have a pair of synthetic boxers right here. Um, this is sort of an item that's a little overlooked, especially on those hot days because you can start sweating and get chafe in all those special places. And so it would maybe be nice to have one, at least one pair, or uh, maybe two or so, uh, for just those especially hot days when uh, you're worried about sweating. It is kind of a overlooked layer. This is the Outdoor Research Echo Boxers, and they are pretty nice, I gotta say. You'll find actually throughout this table, I use a lot of outdoor research gear. And that's usually because it's really good. I'm even wearing an outdoor research jacket right now, but that's just because it's so good and I really like it uh, for myself. And um, we also sell a lot of outdoor research in the store. We, we can at least get our hands on everything I have here if you want this specific thing. But uh, a lot of this stuff we'll already have in the store as well as anyone in the store can help you out with comparable items to what I'm gonna show you. All right, moving up to pants. Uh, me personally, I don't really do long underwear, uh, especially for rock climbing. Uh, I just get too hot. Uh, other people uh, tend to get more cold, that tend to get more cold or cold-blooded. They may consider uh, wearing like a different style of pant. I wouldn't say wear some long underwear and then the pant over it uh, just for the chilly mornings because it is going to warm up pretty fast and you're going to warm up while walking. So what I have here is just a pair of lightweight shot soft shell pants. This is the Outdoor Research Ferocity Pants. Um, I like them <laughs> for what they are. They're made specifically for climbing. Uh, really kind of any pair of pants will work for you but you do want something that's stretchy. Um, jeans may not be the best option, uh, but I do have a little cheat for you if you're interested on in how to actually manage to climb with jeans. Uh, but uh, yeah, these pants are made for climbing. They're made for multi-pitch climbing. They have a little pocket on the side. This is the best part about pants that are made for climbing is they stick a pocket that goes underneath your leg loop. So if your leg loop's right here, you have a pocket underneath that you can 
uh, put your phone in or whatever else you want. So that's a really nice feature. And a lot of them are zipper pockets as well. Um, these pants also have a little thing in the cuff where I can roll them up and turn them into shorts if I so want to. Uh, this isn't a commercial for the pants, I'm just saying um, pretty much every climbing pant has that, those sort of features. So uh, that's just worth looking into, maybe getting a pair or two. And uh, even for a full week, you only really need one pair of pants. So you don't have to break the bank and buy five different pairs of pants for your one week of climbing. You, you, you can wear the same pair of pants all week. I'm probably gonna be doing that. Uh, also on those really hot days when um, it's just really hot, bring a pair of shorts. I'm gonna have a pair of shorts too. Uh, but uh, the deal with those is really there's no performance thresholds. It, maybe it'd be nice to have them a little stretchy, but I find that pretty much any pair of shorts you have work for climbing. Uh, except for those like super short shorts that girls like to wear that may get some chafing with your leg loop. But I wouldn't know because I've never had that problem because I don't wear those shorts. Um, a little detour here to hand wear. Uh, gloves are not something that I'll usually bring for something like this besides the belay gloves. Uh, these are gloves just for the sake of keeping your hands warm. If you want to bring them, then just a nice light pair of gloves. Pretty much anything will work because you're going to take them off the minute you start climbing anyway. Um, so yeah, it's just like, if you want gloves, then go with gloves. Me personally, I don't use gloves and I just stick my hands in the pockets in my jacket or my pants uh, on this sort of setup for rock climbing, I mean. All right, so the upper body, this is where you get pretty swagged out with gear, but um, it all sort of serves a purpose and it's all not completely necessary depending on what time of year you are that down in Smith. One thing that is very necessary is a synthetic shirt. This is the Outdoor Research Echo shirt and um, it's just super lightweight. And the point of these base layer shirts are really to wick moisture away from you, uh, from your body. Uh, but it is just like a good first layer uh, and it's super light so that way in the sun you're not going to get super sweated out with this. Cotton is kind of annoying in that case because it'll just trap all the water and then if you get a gust of wind you'll start freezing. So it is really not, it's really worth it to pick up, you know, a uh, non-cotton shirt. It doesn't have to be synthetic, you know, climbing shirt. It could be a running shirt if you already have one of those. Uh, just some sort of active layer shirt. That's what you want. Me personally, uh, especially on sunny days, I prefer collared shirts. So this shirt, this is the uh, OR Astro Man. And I have a couple other different shirts, but it's a short sleeve collared shirt and has buttons uh, closure. It's like an you know office workspace sort of shirt, or at least it looks like that. And I like the collar because it helps protect my neck from the sun. Uh, also, this material is is pretty nice. Um, it's like this is made as a sun shirt, so it is pretty nice in the sun. And so um, I, you'll probably see me wearing a shirt like this every day. Um, and uh, as far as shirts go, you can have, if you're going bare minimum, you could bring two or three pairs of shirts and just keep on, you know, and keep the same shirt every day. If you're going full bare minimum, just bring one pair of pants and one shirt and keep wearing that. But I'm sure not everyone would like that. Uh, this next layer, this one's kind of more or less optional. This is a sun hoodie. Uh, again, when the sun starts really blazing down on you, uh, it would be nice to have something to uh, help protect your skin a bit more. This has long sleeves and a hood, and uh, it's still super thin. This is the same Echo series as the shirt I showed you, and they are both very thin pieces of clothing. So not only will that help protect you, but also it packs down, it's super small, and you can always find a place for that in your backpack. So those are uh, good things to keep in mind. Uh, I may not roll with the sun hoodie every day, but I have been known to, so here's that. Now we're getting into more insulation and protection layers. And um, I, have, I pretty much use the same layering system for uh, everywhere. Uh, I find that it works out pretty well, especially in a variety of situations. So right here I have the OR, I think this is the transition. It's just a really lightweight um, wool layer and it, oh fleece, fleece layer. And it has this grid pattern technology on the inside, which helps trap more heat 
And so this, for how lightweight the coat is, it actually keeps you surprisingly warm. And so that's usually my first layer after my, you know, my t-shirt or whatever, uh, just for the sake of keeping warm. Now, a lot of times while climbing, especially when it's super windy, just wearing that one red jacket uh, isn't quite enough to keep me fully comfortable. And so I will put this jacket, this is the Ferrosi jacket, over that. This thing sort of functions as a wind layer, but it breathes a little bit more. It's not fully wind resistant, I would say. Uh, but it does help cut quite a bit and uh, help with other protection too. It's more of just a protection layer other than insulation layer. However, it does trap some heat, but mostly it's just a protection layer. And I use it over that and it's a really good winning combo that, uh, that I keep on using because I just like it so much. Another thing that I could put on over either that layer or the two layers, depending on whatever sort of conditions, if it's super blustery, super windy, I have this wind layer. And this is a jacket. It's not waterproof, but it is windproof and water resistant. So water resistant pretty much means it's not waterproof. Windproof means that when it's blowing, the wind's not going to cut through this layer. And it packs down. This is probably the smallest packing down piece I have. Yeah, it packs down to just nothing. Uh, folds into its own pocket and I can clip it onto my harness and just pull it out whenever I need it. And uh, th this is a game changer in terms of comfort. So that is something that you might want to consider depending on the weather forecast is bringing a wind layer out with you because it will, it will definitely add some comfort, especially while you're sitting at those exposed belays and, um, and just getting hammered by the wind. Now, uh, as for actual more insulation layers that I would use either in the early morning or the evening or uh, just when it's cold and stuff. Uh, I got some, I got two more insulative layers. This one right here is the Outdoor Research Uber Light, Uber Layer jacket. I don't even think they actually make this anymore. I think they got a different jacket now. But it's a synthetic layer. It keeps you very warm for uh, what it is. And it, if I put it in combination with the other red jacket and the blue jacket right here, these three together, that's a pretty winning combination. This is the heaviest layer I will walk out to the crag with um, when, I'm, uh, when I'm out, you know, working because it's just a very nice warm jacket and it keeps, uh, it, it does help cut the wind a bit, but any sort of synthetic or down jacket or coat or warm coat or even fleece that you have or wool, it'll all work for this piece in place of that. Now this one's kind of more of an insurance layer. I kind of find it hard to leave the house for, you know, a multi-day camping trip without some form of puffy, but um, don't expect to use this in late May, anytime in the summer and maybe early October. So if you're going early season, like the early season trips in May, the late season trips in October, I would definitely recommend bringing one of these. But in the other uh, months, maybe just settle with your slightly smaller insulation layer. Uh, and that does depend on a number of things like weather and stuff. There are cold snaps here and there. I've had uh, three or four days in a row where I've woken up at Smith Rocks and it's been, you know, high 20s, maybe low 30s. And so th that was just a cold snap. And so what I do is I get out of my sleeping bag and put on a bunch of jackets, including this down layer. And so that's just something to think about. Depending on the weather, it may be nice to have a thicker puffy jacket um, just in case you hit any cold snaps. So that's just another thing to think about. Of course, another thing we can't leave home without is the raincoat. Uh, if it rains in Smith Rocks, we're not going to be climbing. <laughs> it, may be, uh, it may start raining that day and then we hike out in the rain and so it'd be nice to have a raincoat, but um, we're not going to try to climb rocks when it's downpouring uh, just because it's not fun. And uh, it's kind of, it's really hard and actually very dangerous. So there are a couple of sheltered places we can go to to avoid the rain. Uh, where the rock is, you know, slightly overhanging or has some protection so that way it doesn't get wet. And uh, we'll just go to those places. But uh, 
A raincoat is still nice to have. This is the OR uh, Ultra Light Raincoat, whatever that one's called. And this one also packs down really small, so I don't really mind having it in my backpack. Uh, and it is waterproof, so that way it'll just sort of keep all the rain out, at least until I get to my car or whatever. Uh, one thing to understand is really I wouldn't use this for anything other than rock climbing where it's like little spouts of rain. I would not recommend having this coat for anything serious like mountaineering or expeditions because it's just so thin and it's going to get wetted out so much faster than Gore-Tex. Little side note there, but it is nice to have a rain coat. All right, so I made it up to the head. Um, some people might consider bringing like some sort of a uh, warm hat. Me personally, I'm not a big fan of these um, just cause I guess I don't like them, but also all my jackets have hoods. So I just put the hood on my head and it replaces this as well as protecting or warming up my neck. So uh, if you want to bring this then feel free, uh, I'm not, I'm personally not going to bring it for a rock climbing trip. What I am going to bring are sun hats. So I got a baseball cap here. It just goes on my head. Uh, if I bring a, I can also wear a helmet over this if I want. And then that way I can uh, keep the brim protection while my helmet's on. I don't really tend to do that climbing too much, but uh, if I'm teaching a class on the ground, then yeah, I'll do that. But uh, I think it's kind of annoying while you're climbing. If you have short hair like me, it may be nice to get some extra protection for your ears, mainly in the back of your neck. So you can go with the old farmer style sun hat that helps cover up more of your face uh, and protect it from the sun. So, you know, depending on the day, I tend to use these for more cragging days where you're hanging out on the ground a lot. And then on multi-pitch days when I'm usually not climbing with a hat, I'll just wear this on the approach and then take it off uh, when I start climbing. Obviously, going along with that sun protection for your face, make sure you have a nice pair of sunglasses. These aren't the most expensive sunglasses on the market, but they do have this little wrap around for your eyes. And um, they are a bit of a darker sort of sunglass, so they're really great in the bright sun. I love using these things for rock stuff. And then always have your sunscreen uh, and lip screen too, if you're worried about your lips being burnt. I find these little banana boat <laughs> sunscreen tubes to be pretty useful. Uh, this is SPF 30. I think the board is up to get at least SPF 20 or 15 or whatever and just apply it every hour or so. So, uh, yeah, just go with whatever sunscreen you feel is best for you. Anything will be better than nothing. All right, last thing I'm going to talk about is camping equipment. So uh, in this trip, uh, we're right next to Bend, Oregon and a little bit further from uh, Redmond, Oregon. And so you don't actually have to camp if you don't want to, if you just want to climb, you know, from nine to five and then um, go to your hotel or motel or whatever in the city, then feel free to do that uh, if you're just not in the camping mood. Uh, MIAR will have camping spots uh, or a camping spot for everyone. And uh, we'll also provide, you know, the tents. We can uh, rent you sleeping bags and sleeping pads. Uh, we can pretty much, we have all the camping gear taken care of, but I figured I'd throw in a few suggestions uh, in case you want to bring your own equipment. The first thing being sleeping bags. Uh, this is just a down sleeping bag. Um, any sleeping bag will do. Uh, we're probably going to get temperatures, you know, at lowest, maybe low 30s normally. Uh, and so uh, that's what you can expect for. If you get like a sleeping bag that's like a 40 degree sleeping bag, one thing you can do to save some money instead of buying a new one is you get these sleeping bag liners. I think uh, Sea to Summit makes them. One's for like 10 degrees, another is 25 degrees. And uh, what it'll do is it'll roughly lower the temperature of your sleeping bag from say 40 degrees down to, you know, 20 or so. Uh, it's not exact science, but uh, it will provide some more insulation and be enough to make it through the week. Uh, along that, Along that path is sleeping pads. Uh, here are the two main sleeping pads that people use. Uh, I got an inflatable Neo Air X Flight, which everyone uses for mountaineering nowadays. It's super small, super compact, super awesome, uh, but not that comfortable. And then I have the old school Thermarest Z Lite, 
which is just a foam pad. And um, pretty much any sleeping pad is going to work. Uh, I would say actually neither of these are the very top of the comfort level. Uh, if you want a super comfortable sleeping pad, go to Cedar Summit and get there. I think it's called the Comfort Plus or whatever. I just bought that sleeping pad to sleep in my car for a month and it is amazing. I mean, like, I'm going to recommend that to everyone who wants comfort. So uh, if you want a comfortable pad, go to REI or whatever and or online and uh, find a super comfortable pad. Uh, if you're gonna rent from us, then you're gonna get either one of these or the Thermarest roll-up ones. It's not like these are super uncomfortable. It's just like, they're not, you know, the top. But they'll definitely get the job done. The major point of a sleeping pad isn't so much for comfort, it's from insulating your body against the ground so that way that doesn't steal all the heat from you. If you have a sleeping pad, anything will work. Bottom line. Alright, as far as tents go, again, Miar will have our tents. I think we're going to be using a lot of three-person tents, uh, depending on what kind of tents we have. Uh, this is a two-person tent. Uh, if you want to bring your own tent, then feel free. It's not like uh, you don't need any hardcore mountaineering tent or anything for this trip. You just need a tent. Or if you actually want to, there is a bivy section in the campsite where you sleep out under the stars which is actually really cool if you haven't done it yet. And I personally prefer that because it's the least amount of pack up in the end. Uh, but if you want to bring your own tent, feel free. Miar will have all the tents for you, bottom line. Uh, lighting, you know, use your standard headlamp. This one's a three, uh, a three speed headlamp. This is the Petzl Actik. I think that's how you say it, A-C-T-I-K. And this is a little more hardcore than you would possibly need for this. I think this one goes up to like, like 300 lumens or something. Uh, if you follow, if you've done any of our mountaineering stuff, we're real specific about the headlamps being at least 300 lumens or more. Uh, in this trip, we're probably not going to be in the dark. What you need this headlamp for is finding your way from your tent to the bathroom, and then back to your tent. Uh, we're never gonna. We're probably not going to walk out in the dark. We may walk into the the uh, park in the dark, but um, we're not going to be walking out of the park. It's just like if you go anywhere and buy the 150 to 200 lumen headlamp, that's like 30 bucks, you'll be fine. So you don't need to break out your, you know, winter headlamp with a separate battery pack and everything like that. Just a standard headlamp. Obviously bottles of water. Uh, I got two Nalgene's right here. Uh, depending on the heat throughout the day and your personal biosymmetry, uh, anywhere from one to two liters throughout the day uh, will work for you. I'm going to leave that up to your own discretion since you guys know how uh, your body works and everything. Me personally, I like to bring one liter and like a Gatorade, uh, just like those little quart bottles because I, uh, I enjoy the electrolyte and the sugar in the Gatorade and uh, helps get me through the day. So I don't really, I've never really brought out two liters with me while a day of rock climbing. Mountaineering is a different story, but that's just a little bit about the camping equipment. If you have any questions regarding anything that we've talked about in this video, climbing gear, personal climbing gear, you know, camping stuff, clothing, uh, or anything else involving the trip itself, like specific goals you want to do, specific climbs you want to do. You can feel free to email me. Again, my email is rtills at live.com, R-T-I-L-L-S at live.com. And uh, you can email me, ask me questions. If you want to set up a personal trip, then we can also do that too if you email uh, me. If you want more information, then you can go to Miar's website uh, that has more breakdown sort of stuff. Um, and uh, I'll also have that link in the description too to the Smith Rock page of Miar's website. And then uh, I appreciate you guys watching, and then I'll see you out there at Smith Rocks.